it's great to see such a huge crowd. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce Roland. You may know him from Sensi Lab as the architect who uh, designed the lab. Um, and hopefully everyone will agree to do a great job. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Under duress. Under duress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a battle in some stages. But um, Roland has his own creative practice that involves a lot of computational design, agent-based modeling, um, and he does amazing stuff with robots as well. So of course, obviously, the showpiece for Sensor Lab is the 3D printers war, which um, uh, Roland and his team developed um, and continues to work in that, that space um, and is internationally renowned for that. So it's really great pleasure to welcome him. And at last, because we've been trying to get him here for ages, he's a very busy man. Um, so thank you, Roland, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. So thank you. All right, well, John, thank you very much. And yeah. it's, um, it is a, quite a treat to come back and, and present in a room that I've uh, designed. Yeah. Um, uh, so I guess, yeah, my practice is split into two parts. It's um, One part of it is um, I have a small research lab at um, RMIT University um, in the architecture program. And that's about six people. It's sort of growing. I think by the end of the year, we'll be about nine or ten people. Um, so, you yeah, know, much, much smaller than here and less a young lab, I guess. Um, and then I have an architecture practice, um, studio role in Snooks. And the practice is really to try and test some of the things we're developing more experimentally, test in real architecture projects. And so what I'm going to try and show today is sort of a combination of some of, the, of both those things, probably more on the research side. And I want to discuss a uh, generative design methodology that we've been working with that I describe as a behavioral formation. And then look at the way that's been tested through a series of prototypes and what sort of feedback and uh, resistance it has to um, different fabrication techniques or different non-generative techniques. So behavioral formation is a generative uh, approach which draws from the logic of swarm intelligence and operates through multi-agent algorithms. And it's really an attempt to try and take design intention and encode it into a series of uh, semi-autonomous agents. Look at the interaction of those agents and the way that leads to a self-organized design intention in some way, and what sort of type of emergent outcomes it generates. And then a lot of this work is then really looking at um, the types of geometries and the complexity of those geometries that are created, and how we might start to build them. And as we start to build them, what influence those strategies have on the design process, and how we start to feed back some of those um, fabrication constraints into the, the generative process. So perhaps the best way of explaining it is by jumping into a project. This is um, perhaps the littlest project we've created. It's a, um, it was developed out of a bridge that we originally designed and were asked to exhibit um, in France at the Pompidou Center. And we decided to try and take the logic that was we used to create the bridge and then take it to a logical extreme and see what that could make. And so this is um, the type of algorithm that underlies it. So it's, as I said, it's a multi-agent algorithm, a swarm algorithm. And it's where these individual agents are interacting and they're going from, I guess, a, a cloud of, um, of noise, of randomness, and through the interactions, some type of high level order is emerging from that. Um, this second animation is showing what we describe as an agent body. So it's a little piece of geometry which um, we instantiate onto the agent, and that has another level of, um, of design and geometry and agent-based decision-making that goes into it. This is a close-up of one of those animations, and I guess from this, what I'm trying to demonstrate is the type of uh, organization that we're making, which is not quite a surface, it's not quite a lattice, it's not quite a volume, but perhaps it's somewhere in between those, and I guess in many ways that's what this, um, this project is looking at. And you can see here, this, this animation is quite subtle, but um, although what we described, the, the limbs of these bodies start to connect to each other. And so I guess there's two levels of agency here. One is on the overall formation, and the other one is, again, um, and the other one is um, how their geometry connects. And they connect for several reasons. Part of it is about making continuous structural lines, and the other one is about generating certain types of, um, of ornamental or expressive we um, generate a lot of our work through coding, obviously. Um, this is an interface from, um, from Java, from processing. This is something we use for a lot of our high 
resolution projects. Um, a lot of our lower resolution projects, we do something similar in, um, uh, in Rhino and Grasshopper. So this is the type of geometry that's then generated from it. And as I said, it's sort of somewhere between um, surface lattice and, um, and volume, um, a type of sort of fibrous, um, fibrous mass in a way. And then a lot of our work becomes how we figure out how to materialize these things and what implications that has on design. So in this little project, it's more or less a straightforward process because we're going from the digital model straight into um, uh, an SLM 3D print. So this is, um, it's not a very big object, it's about 600 mil across, um, and each element is about um, 0.4 of a millimeter in diameter, each of those little uh, lattice struts. Uh, we've done similar projects as well in titanium, which we can get a little bit finer and are obviously, um, obviously stronger. Now, when I first started working with SLM, which you, you're probably aware of, it's basically um, a process where you put down a la layer of titanium or aluminum powder, and then you fuse it together with a laser, and so you've got many layers. Um, when we first started working with it, I guess we were surprised by the limitations of it. We assumed because it's a powder-based process that it wouldn't have any geometric limitations, but it has things like um, limitations on the um, angles. You can only be a maximum of or well, minimum of 30 degrees off the horizontal, um, and you can't bridge more than three millimeters. There's a whole series of other constraints. And so a lot of this project was about how you build those constraints into the, the generative model, because this is obviously a geometry that's too hard to go back and, and fix up errors. Um, you can't manually get in there and tinker with it, and so all that stuff has to be sort of encoded into the logic of the agent. So there's a two-step process with that. Part of that is the uh, the agents have some understanding of what those constraints are and try to behave within those. And then there's also another algorithm that comes through afterwards and basically tries to clean it up, tries to remove bits that don't work, attach bits, reattach pieces, um, and try and do that without destroying the overall character of it. And I guess one thing that we find is if you tinker with these geometries too much, even if they're a whole lot of very small tinkerings, then the whole character changes. And sometimes that happens without you really noticing it. So, um, the edges we try to make frayed, um, under the wings are sort of more turbulent. Um, when you sort of pull out, the whole thing becomes a bit more matte, I guess, it sort of loses detail. And one of the things we realized by doing that is that at a certain, we had this belief in wanting to do things at the highest resolution we could, and we began to realize that, um, of course, you need a lot of um, self-similarity to be able to achieve order in it. And we feel like in this image, perhaps the order is lost, because it's actually too fine too fine a grain, um, but it works better the closer you are uh, to it. Okay, so that's a that's the smallest project. Now, I'm going to briefly try and talk about the algorithms, um, the way that's operated through a series of projects, and then get into the sequence of prototypes that um, are really the way one project has led to another one. So this is um, our work really goes back to Craig Reynolds Boyd's algorithm. Um, obviously, his attempt to try and simulate flocks of birds, schools of fish, and social insects. And this is a type of catalog of, of behaviors that we write. They're still all um, vector-based behaviors. They're just very simple about um, the way one piece of geometry relates to another. And I guess initially we started doing these types of um, generative simulations where this one's a stigmergic one. So an agent is drawing a line and agents are following those lines. It generates a type of order. And when we're designing, we're, we're designing through these, I guess, four different modes. So we're, we're diagramming behaviors, we're figuring out the, the vector additions often. We're writing pseudo code to describe what's happening. Of course, we're writing the behaviors as, as code, in that case in Java. And working this way is never something which is, um, it's binary, it's never something or something else. But we're always working where behaviors are accumulated. And so um, it's a negotiation between different behaviors which I think is a pretty interesting way of thinking about design in terms of um, one thing not having to be a priori to another. You can just think about all these different design um, decisions, battling it out um, and negotiating. Now, most multi-agent systems are considered to be um, sort of the point as a substrate. Um, it's very hard to make architecture from just points, so we're interested in using high-level geometries. So we have strands, networks, meshes, and something called an agent body. I'll talk about that in more detail later. So very briefly, um, I guess I've been working on this stuff now for um, 17 or 18 years, and we've used it in all sorts of different ways across architectural projects. So 
in some projects like this one, this is a competition entry for a museum in China, we were using it as a way of generating form and also looking at the relationship between form, surface articulation, and then structure, and where those things have a kind of intrinsic relationship to each other, generated through the same algorithm, or the way it might start to generate, this, in this case, a sort of furry articulation. The way a single piece of geometry can start to negotiate between a whole set of different architectural roles. So often in architecture, I guess there's a one-to-one -one relationship between what a bit of architecture does and what its geometry is. So a, a column resists um, vertical load, for example. Um, and there's a piece of geometry that has a particular role. In this, what we're talking about is the idea that you can have a piece of geometry, in this case, the concrete shell of the tower, which is negotiating between um, its structural loads, um, what it needs to do to become a, a skin. If it got down to a fine enough grain, perhaps you could describe it as being ornamental, it's not expressive. It opens up at certain points and becomes spatial. So it's this idea that you know, the one geometry can negotiate different roles. So it's not like a geometry has an architectural role, but architectural roles become behaviors that negotiate through geometry. So we've done this through several of these, these types of towers. And, and then also looked at um, the way this happens at different scales. So this is something, a little object that's generated um, with the same type of fibrous strands at the scale of um, form as well as its, its ornament. When we started doing this work, we were very optimistic about the capacity to generate everything from, a, um, from an algorithm in a bottom-up way. I guess we began to realize that as soon as we started tackling real architecture projects, this is a competition we lost about 10 years ago, 11 years ago um, for the Taipei Performing Arts Center, we of course realized that lots of architectural problems aren't complex ones. They're not ones that, that need generative approach or you know, have any reason to engage with emergence. Um, so we started looking at the way you can have a relationship between things which are um, bottom up and top down. And so in this case, we modeled this green roof as, um, as a surface and then allowed certain parts of it to then begin to reform. Um, the following year, we did this slightly more sophisticated project in collaboration with Tom Wiscombe, an architect in LA. And this was where we had this battle between things that we would model directly, and then we'd put it into an algorithm that would reform it, and then come back and re would remodel it, until these two things came into some sort of um, uh, synthetic correlation, like they, um, they started to be the same. So they started off being Frankensteins, those sort of these weird rocks with these weird tentacles on them, and slowly it became this one coherent thing between them top down and And also trying to blur, um, again, the type of geometry and its role. So this is really a geometry that's made up of a lot of strands at different scales. And some of those strands are uh, spatial, some of them are formal, some of them are structural, some of them get down to a, uh, a grain where they're just ornamental. Well, not just ornamental, they are ornamental. Um, and similar types of strategies in, in these projects. OK. Um, I'm heavily engaged in algorithmic design, but I'm also quite critical of algorithmic design. I think the, one of the reasons for that is I got into this realm because I'm interested in speculation and I'm interested in trying to create things which are not necessarily known or less, perhaps less known. And I think that um, a lot of algorithmic design is quite indexical. People know what the relationship between the algorithm and the pattern or form that it generates. So what happens, I think, typically in algorithmic design is people select an algorithm because they know the result. And therefore, algorithmic design, I think, just becomes an act of selection, or design process is an act of selection, rather than speculation or experimentation. And um, I quite like multi-agent systems because I think it's such a broad, generalizable model that you can actually probably simulate almost anything with a multi-agent system. Um, but it still falls, falls into these tropes and um, cliché. So a lot of what we've been doing is trying to undermine those, um, those tropes. So this is one attempt to undermine it through um, a feedback between direct top-down decisions and the bottom-up algorithm. In this case, it's with what we describe as painted operations. So we're using, in this case, we're using um, ZBrush. And um, we're generating things, and we're sort of brushing onto them, and then we're taking them back in and regenerating them, et cetera, et cetera. And trying to make something that can't be described or easily understood as being either algorithmic or painted. And we're trying to make this strange hybrid. Um, 
Joe trees, which are something that sits between those, those two ways of working. So this is one object which we'll love sections through. And it's something we've done with students a lot. So this is um, from an undergraduate studio that I teach at RMIT. And um, we, we ask the students to make normally about 20 of these objects every week. And so they're constantly having to design these very, very rapidly um, to try and develop some sort of aesthetic sensibility. Doing so. Another way is trying to force computational behavior to interact very directly with material behavior. And so if this is kind of crude diagram, perhaps the top line is saying um, you might use an agent to generate a form which you might build with a robot. Um, or you might get in the second line a close interaction between what the agent does and what the robot does. And the third one is what if the robot is just, is just the agent. Um, and so we did this kind of slightly ridiculous um, project where we just put um, a foam extruder on the end of one robot and the other robot is trying to scan it. In fact, this couple of scanned the um, this, this robot's scanning with a, um, just a connect, so very lo-fi. Um, this one's got a little structure sensor on it, and there's another connect on the, the stick above it, and it's putting all this information into a voxel model, and so the robot sees something like that. Um, it's pretty low res. But what's happening here is that um, there's no a priori design. So the robot just has a series of behaviors, and it's just scanning, and whatever it sees, it responds to. Um, it's our very first attempt to sort of can a spray in the end. But you could see that you know something was happening there. It was clearly something is emerging. It's not complete noise. It's something I wanted to. It's almost like those kind of weird little daps, almost like strokes that would make we discussed them. Um, but it would make weird things. And uh, I think they, these are genuinely strange. And um, like this is not something I would ever design. But it's something that's pretty curious and I kind of like it. Um, and there are lots of different types of characteristics that come out of it. So I'd say that you know each of these things have very real different characteristics, which you can't say is just about the material, because otherwise they would be all very similar. But there's something about these, which is um, interaction between the behavior of the robot, the way it's depositing, um, and the material. So it's, there's some interaction between material behavior and computational behavior, and these are the negotiated result of that. Um, we chose foam because it's the most volatile thing you can imagine. There's no point having a real-time feedback system if you know how the material will behave. Um, I guess we could simulate it. Uh, the rest of what I want to talk about today, and I, I just speed up a little bit, is um, is based on this algorithm. So this is something um, I call a agent agent body algorithm, and it's basically where um, the agent is not simply a point, but it has its high-level geometry, and in this case. It's made up of several limbs, several arms, and each of the control points on those limbs is also an agent. And so that each one of those makes a decision about how it interacts, but inherits some sort of um, limitations from its body in terms of flexibility and what the limbs can and cannot do. Originally, we developed this for an ornamental project. This was the design of a ceiling for a museum we were doing competition for. And I guess in this, I like to think that there is some sort of order emerging from the field, emerging from the mass. And then as you zoom in, there's different um, types of geometry. There's sort of you know, this kind of wing-like um, individual piece of geometry. Then if you if you look here, there's um, this is sort of near symmetry here, um, where these two agents are interacting in an almost symmetrical way. Um, it's not something that's encoded. It's something which is an emergent property. And as you zoom in closely, you get these types of things. And um, this was this is a bit old now. It's about ten years old. But when we did this, we were struck by how um, what we thought we thought it was quite strange and unusual. And I guess this sort of search this has become something we now look for. We look for things which we consider to be strange and we can't immediately evaluate as being as being beautiful or ugly or something else. The first time we used this on a more defined architectural project was this museum and memorial at Baba Yar in Kiev. It's this sort of rock-like um, museum that sits above a quite a figural landscape. It's sort of an inverted monument, so it's a sort of space, memorial space. And the landscape's generated through a similar type of multi-agent algorithm. It's a, a field which is charged, and then 
the agents navigate that field, um, working stigmatically, so they're responding to the, the trails that they lay, um, in order to generate something like that. And the idea is there's a series of different levels of intensity, um, and at a certain point, that sort of seemed to be intense enough to carve space out of this rock. And I guess I had a series of um, deliberate juxtapositions in the work. Most of the work that I, I do is trying to make a very synthetic relationship between everything. So there's a blurring of, of role and geometry, and um, whereas this is trying to make these sort of more clear dichotomies between them. So it has a um, sort of smooth um, stone skin, and then it has this very intensive um, bronze memorial space that's carved out. And try, it's trying to evoke some sort of um, visceral response, especially for an intense space. And that's the, um, the diagram of the agent bodies. It's a very simple little body, but it generates things that are quite complex through the interactions. And again, a kind of um, juxtaposition between the intensity of the memorial space and the kind of calmness of the museum space. So we've used this type of algorithm to make a whole series of different um, parts of buildings, I guess. We've made these sort of fabric type parts, which sort of shift between knotting and, and weaving. Uh, I like this image because it's showing a change in quite a kind of catastrophic change here, which I would say, between a highly sort of muted and more woven geometry, but it all happens within a continuous field. It's not a, it's not a collage of different types. We've looked at um, the way these might be surfaced and the way they relate to, to skin. There's little studies for in Taiwan. Um, okay, so I'll come back to this animation. And the reason is because um, we started to try and team up um, these agent bodies with something we describe as a manifold swarm algorithm, which is this going from the cloud into some type of surface. And what we're trying to do here is um, all the other work, the agents needed some other substrate to run on, which is typically things we would model. And one of the reasons for that is um, multi-agent systems have a hard time understanding global um, problems, I suppose. I, I describe them as being globally ignorant. Um, and global issues in architecture, I mean, in terms of architectural design, are things like um, structure. You can't understand the structure of a building by understanding one part of it you need to understand the flow of structure through the whole project. Likewise, you can't understand the topology or enclosure um, of a building by understanding one part of it. You need to understand the whole thing. Agents don't think that way. They think deliberately locally, and they do that in order to generate emergence. But um, that means they're typically very bad at making topology and space and form, and they're much better at making um, finer grain articulation. So this is really an attempt to try and get them to generate um, form and space and surface. Um, and so these are these are agents that are programmed to try and make things that are locally flat. By making things locally flat, they make these sort of pseudo minimal surfaces on a larger scale. So really it's an attempt to try and uh, make an, a single algorithm which is making space and surface, but it's also making the articulation what I describe as the tectonics of the project. And we test this over a couple of projects. This one in, in Helsinki is so the roof of, a, of an architecture school, um, and, and several other projects. That, and this was about 2012, we were doing these projects. And I guess I'll go back to this one and say this became a really important image. Basically since then, the last, what is it now, like seven years, I've been trying to build this image. And that's basically all my work has gone into this because uh, seven years ago, I realized that making these types of images um, is a bit ridiculous because we had no way of building those. And so either we had to make things that were simpler that we could build, or we had to engage with new ways of making them, try and invent new ways of building these things. And so we've been trying to do the latter. So to try and make these types of things, uh, my first response was to look at fiber composites and um, things like um, using glass fiber and carbon fiber. So we did a whole series of experiments with, um, with students, different workshops at different universities, testing some ornamental qualities of these, um, expressive qualities of fiberglass, uh, what sort of detail it might generate. Uh, and this was the first 
so a substantial project we, we tried from this. This is a little installation in um, 2013. It's about two and a half metres tall. And it's an attempt to try and compress surface structure and ornament into a single irreducible whole. Like each of those become interdependent. Similar type of algorithm um, where they're trying to swarm to find a coherent surface. And then basically we, we work out ways of building these bodies from cast flexible polyurethane foam and then sandwich them between layers of fiberglass um, to make them into a continuous surface. So that's a little chunk of that. Now, um, because we were casting, we couldn't cast everyone differently. We needed just to have, in this case, we decided on three types. And we just make um, a lot of these three different types. Um, and we cast them from foam that was flexible but not wouldn't stretch. So then we had to take those behaviors and encode them back into the digital model. So we knew our digital agent would um, flex but not stretch. Um, we made, milled a mold. Um, then we put down layers of fiberglass. These polyurethane bo bodies get pressed in to where you can see that the, um, the outline of those has been milled into the mold and covered with more fiberglass and then using a process of vacuum infusion, um, making that rigid. It's a very wasteful project. Um, we <laughs> threw away the mold, of course. And it was actually really, I, I spent you know, three weeks of my time sanding this mold obsessively and coating it with more um, resin and sanding it. And then you just cut it off with a hacksaw and a hammer. And um, I guess we realized that wasn't a really sustainable or kind of sensible way to go forward. I wanted to sh quickly talk about this image. Um, the way the project gets its strength is through geometry rather than material. So it takes two very um, flexible materials. The fiberglass is less than a millimeter thick, 0.85 mm, super bendy. The polyurethane bodies are floppy. But when they come together, they become rigid. And the reason is because it increases the structural depth from less than a millimeter to about 12 millimeters. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a huge difference. And that makes it rigid. And also, these bodies make um, continuous um, ridges, um, corrugations. And so the fact that these bodies are trying to connect their limbs together make these continuous structural ridges that go through the project and give it strength. It also gains strength from its overall geometry, like that's double curved. Um, so because of the problem of trying to make that with um, having to make a mold as big as the part, um, that wasn't sustainable when we go to a larger piece like this. So the previous project was seven square meters, this one's closer to 70 square meters. And so we needed to find a way of rationalizing and optimizing it. And also, we couldn't build it ourselves. It's too big. And so we needed a boat builder to, to do it. So we needed to simplify some processes um, so it could be done by somebody else. These initial sketches, the last renders before we started to work how to rationalize the project to make it buildable. And it, these are our first attempts of using um, vacuum infusion to make little prototypes. So. It's made from uh, eight parts, and three of them are flat, and then five of them, sorry, five of them are um, are curved, and all the curved parts um, come off the one mold, and so we're trying to hide the repetition in the project. So it does repeat, but not in a way that's obvious. It sort of just creates a um, familiarity, I think. Uh, but because the mold had to take several parts. We couldn't make it from foam, it would disintegrate after a couple of um, laminations. So we made it from MDF, sort of robotically in three axis milled. Um, and then also just having carpenters build the flat bits. Um, so it's quite a big mold, it's about five meters by six meters by three meters tall. It's like a little little building in itself. And the um, the inlay that gives it structure is at two scales. It's the milled foam and the extruded um, silicon, and in part it's responding to structural requirements. So this is a um, structural analysis of the, of the bending moments of the surface, and our engineers were telling us that it would have a deflection at, at its tip of over a meter without the um, the inlay. And fiberglass is only three mil thick, and so the bodies here are responding by aligning their their limbs to the 
the direction of the bending moments and scaling based on the intensity of those. Again, these are milled. Um, well, sorry, the last ones are cast. These are milled. Um, the milling process turned out to be much more time consuming and difficult than I originally imagined. Um, and again, not a sustainable way of doing something. This process was very quick and easy. This was just extruding using a fairly um, dodgy tool that we built for the end of our robot. Um, a glorified corking gun. And this is, um, this is one of the guys trying to put it all together using um, paper templates where everything goes on the mold. Not great working conditions. Um, <laughs> my builders hated us. Um, but I mean, it's been trimmed back. The piece is fairly deep, though, sort of designed to be as big as we could squeeze into a, um, a same trailer and being installed. So they have one smooth side because the mold, we couldn't mill into the mold because every part of the mold was different. Um, so it had a smooth side and a articulated side. That was that shown at the Design Hub at RMIT initially and then re shown here at um, the Shanghai Biennale. So again, that was really difficult, and um, so we, we're trying to work out easier ways. And the whole process, this whole series of projects, are basically realizing the stupidity of one project and trying to solve that problem only to generate more stupid problems. And so this one, um, we decided, can we use flat sheet material rather than trying to make molds and um, create it in such a complex way? This is just um, thin steel sheet, laser cut all the holes, laser cut. And it's an idea that certain types of geometries, you can unroll them, and when you roll them together, they force three-dimensional form. And so you don't need a mold for this. Um, so we produced this. And then produced a version of the following year from um, fiber composite. So the black skeleton is produced the same way. It's um, composite fiber that's been laser cut, um, glued together in this case and then vacuum infused um, between very thin layers, in this case a quarter of a millimeter of fiberglass. Um, this we were very, um, we were pretty excited about because it was a way of doing fiber composites with no mold and getting double curvature with no mold. That was for a um, Biennale in, in Estonia. Now the problem with that project is it became very, very thin. Um, the first thing I showed you, of course, was this thick, fibrous mass. Um, as we've worked out better and better ways of making this, they've become thinner and thinner, uh, and lost that quality. So we tried to work out other ways of bringing that back. And so this was with um, uh, bent metal rods. So we have two little robots, and they bend the rods. Of course, you can get rod bending machines, but we haven't had two robots and didn't have a rod bending machine. So just use what you've got. Um, and I guess in doing this project, this is a kind of really good example of where we had to learn what the robots could and couldn't do. Um, they have particular limitations about uh, how close one bend can be to another based on the size of the grippers, how many bends in a row you can do before it comes back and hits itself, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of I tried to understand what these constraints are and then build them into the generative model, uh, knowing that then whatever we generate, we could immediately send to, um, to be fabricated. So they do this funny little dance, hanging the rod back and forth to each other. And then it's quite unceremonious and drop it at the end. Um, we, we bent oh, 270 rods in one day. And then we had five people working for five days to assemble it and weld it together. And so we realized we automated the wrong thing. And there must be better ways of doing it. Uh, a little while later, also in Shanghai, we got bigger robots and bigger bits of metal and made a small pavilion. But we like to do these types of things. We like to be able to make um, a larger, in this case a bridge, but sort of architectural scale work from it. And I guess by, by doing all these small studies, we're trying to prove that if we can make it work at a small scale, then you know, there's ways of scaling it up. Of course, um, robots are cheaper than people, and so it's not, not a great stretch to think you can make things that scale. This is kind of the project that brought a lot of those, a lot of those things together. So we had the composites that are too thin, the, um, the rods which were um, thick but didn't have any skin, 
and um, and I guess this is an attempt to try and bring those things together, but also bring together our interest in um, these top-down geometries, which are sort of boulder-like and rock-like, with these um, more generative um, uh, fibrous networks. And this is a competition entry for the, um, the National Gallery's Architectural Commission. So in this case, the aged body is sort of pushing up against um, directly de designed geometries, but then delaminating on the inside into, um, into more uh, network or lattice type geometries that you see in the section. And we realized we needed a completely different way of making them, um, and we had to in do a reverse of what we had been doing. Everything previously, we've been trying to make the, the network, make the aged bodies, and then embed that into some sort of surface. And then we began to think, well, what if we made the surface instead and then tried to cast the aged bodies back into it? And so we started working on this idea of a sacrificial or permanent formwork that we 3D printed. Um, so this is, um, this is you know, obviously the print, the print technique that we then used here, eventually. Um, and what we're doing here is printing a skin with conduits printed into it, which you can sort of barely see there with the idea that then we, we then come back and cast fiber reinforced concrete into those, um, those conduits to make these very fine networks of, um, of structure. And of course, the mold and, um, molds are always much more expensive than the part that you make from them. Um, and formwork is the most expensive part of uh, in situ concrete. So if we can um, basically make the surface have this dual role as also being the formwork, then there's this so we had another crack at this on a small public art project that um, wasn't, was never realized. And we've done a whole series of projects. Um, I guess this started about four years ago. Um, anyway, you probably don't to see that. what 3D printing looks like. Um, and just trying to understand what types of things it does well. And one of the things we've realized is that it's much easier not to start and stop. It's easier to do things which are continuous. So we started looking at um, geometries that were, that were made from one continuous line. Um, and also, what other geometric possibilities there are? Can we start to get some of those painterly forms um, built through this strategy? Uh, this is an example of one of the continuous surfaces. So in this case, like, we wrote an algorithm where the agents were embedded into as vertices of the mesh, and then um, that surface is then starts to, to ripple and corrugate, etc., based on the behaviors of those, those agents. So that's an example of how that works. Um, it starts to sort of scrunch at certain points. And you can see here that um, where it has most load, like um, where it's structurally most problematic, like over this arch, it becomes very deep. It starts to corrugate a lot. And then where it gets to the, the tips, it's becoming much thinner, and it is corrugating in the direction of the cantilever. So it's trying to resist the load in, in that direction. So another competition entry for a pavilion. Um, and of course, none of which we won. And then, then we found somebody who was willing to actually believe in us. <laughs> um, so thanks, John, for that. Um, and, um, but then, that, of course, you know, I won't really talk about this because you have to put up with it every day. But um, we love it. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm very glad. We, we, I mean, for me, this is a super important part of what we've tried to um, try to do because it's the first time that um, yeah somebody believed in it. We had the opportunity to um, fight against all the pragmatic things you need to deal with. Um, lots of people are trying to three D print things. Lots of people are developing innova innovative ways of building, but um, until you've gone through and got past fire codes and building codes and you know convinced the builder it can be done and get it on site, nobody really believes that it's it's real, and so you need um, you need this first step, and even though it's very small, to then enable other things, and that's what this this has been so valuable for us in that way. So, um, so I'm very grateful for you guys, very grateful John. Um, I thought it's a bit weird talking about sensor lab, add sensor lab, but let's <laughs> jump to the next project. Um, but it led to this project. So um, the 3D printed wall outside is only about 20 square meters, and this one is about four times that scale. And it seems to be often we jump, seem to jump up by a factor of four um, quite often. Um, 
So this was, you might have seen this project, this was done at the NGV um, in collaboration with um, Philip Smartsis, who's a sound artist, that's Philip. And um, Philip has all these amazing recordings of the Antarctic and has um, mixed these into a um, sound work, over 16, 16 channel sound work. Um, and the NGV really paired us up and thought that um, they'd seen the, um, the, the wall here at Sensor Lab and um, they, of course, interpreted it as being quite ice-like and asked if we'd try and make something which um, captured some of the, um, the atmosphere from where uh, Philip's recordings were from the Antarctic. And so we tried to make this um, it's a very atmospheric thing. It happens to look like a... People interpret it as a sort of little iceberg or something. It's not really meant to be that. It just, it just looks like that. Um, and it was, it was a great challenge to try and work in the um, NGV, in the Great Hall. It's a very large, it's a fabulous room. It's a very large room. And um, trying to make something that has a presence in there was, was not entirely easy. Uh, the project's got three parts to it. It's got these um, this timber base. Um, it's got a metal structure and then the 3D printed skin. And it's made up of about 70 um, overlapping panels. One of the things we realized by doing the project here is that uh, it's very hard to stop 3D prints from warping. And so in this case, we sort of just check it out and just overlap them. So if they warp a little bit, you can not really, really notice. This project was done under incredible time constraints. So we didn't really have any room for error. So we had to sort of de-risk the project. Uh, that's it. It sort of works as a foil, I think, to the, um, the richness of the Great Hall, um, which is an amazing ceiling, and it ends up framing the ceiling. So it's the details of this. Um, you see the overlapping of those panels. Uh, this is from a processing model. Um, so it's a little swarm of panels that go over, over this form. Um, video is printed. Um, so the, each of those panels took about four or five hours to print. And, but we probably had a failure rate about 20 or 30 percent, so we took about six, six or eight weeks to print, I think. And each panel is, um, they're all similar but different, so they're like a little family of panels, and each one has a, a different ripple on them, and they're slightly um, distorted based on where they sit on the um, project, and sort of have a little lab with them. This is the um, structure that sits in between. Um, I said early on that we're always trying to synthesize structure and skin in the work that we're doing, and in fact, synthesize everything. And this project, because it was done on type time constraints, it really wasn't possible to do an all plastic structure. And we needed, the engineer in fact refused, wisely refused to. Um, in the end, we only gave them a day and a half to do all the engineering on the steel work. And so they said it must be steel. And, but we didn't want to make a steel frame, which we then simply clad. So you can sort of see in this image, we're trying to intertwine the steel and the plastic, um, which then made a whole lot of assembly problems. So you see the structure more from the inside than the outside, but it always really exists between the overlap of the um, panels. That's an unroll of the structure. And the model, so that each one has different size, different thickness of steel, different depth of steel. And you can see there that sort of quite similar to the other aged body models, um, but in plate steel. The base is much simpler. Um, the base is made from um, plywood and MDF, and so it's five axis um, milled ribs, um, and then coated with MDF. It's made out of nine chunks, which you can sort of see here. We only had three and a half days to assemble on site, which is a real challenge. Um, and uh, ch the challenge was, you know, we made that made it difficult for ourselves. The, um, the timber came together very quickly, it was about two hours, but then we had these um, 300 bits of steel, of course everyone is different, and 70 different um, panels, and we had to work out a way of getting it together. Um, so we decided not to use drawings, but to use augmented reality instead. This idea that we could then have, so this is a sc screen grab from the glasses, and um, so we could basically see what we were going to, to build. And when we first did this, we actually had it as a, as a rendered view, um, and it was really confusing, because you just get confused between what was the render 
like what was the hologram, what was the actual physical thing when it was half built, because you're trying to work out where things were. So we had to make it the structure bright yellow so you could see what was what was real and what wasn't really. Um, and when it worked, it worked really well. It was fantastic. Um, there's a little video of these are the, this is the install team from the um, the NGV, and um, they really just took to it. They didn't. Um, it's almost like a very natural technology. They just started working with. It. Of course, they're trying to work out which way around the pieces have to go and how to get it to fit. Um, and one of the complexities of the the way we intertwine steel and the plastic, you can see here, it's going. Each piece goes up with its bits of steel attached to it, and so. Um, one of the problems with that is if you um, if you break a panel, you have to take the whole thing apart and put it back together again. You can't replace the panel because it's in the steel, so it's a stupid way of doing it. But um, it achieved a certain um, a certain concept that we're trying to achieve, which is one is not applied to to the other. Um, so this is a kind of crazy three and a half days of um, looks like three nights things. as well. Yeah, it went pretty late sometimes. Um, it was an amazing installation team. Those guys were so. This is the day it's opening, and we're still. We, they got a second crane in at eight o'clock in the morning because they got nervous, and people were coming in, and you can see, people started coming in about two hours before they allowed into it because the, the paint was still wet. So it was really the just in time <coughs> project. And the, then the thing that I just wanted to end on is is this this one image. This is the project we're currently working on, and we think we finally finally solved. Um, one of the problems we made for ourselves, and this is about how to integrate the structure into the um, skin um, and make something which is continuous rather than overlapping. And this is by using a, a carbon fiber um, infused structure that's um, that's printed. It's a little bit like the concrete I showed earlier, but um, with carbon fiber, we're just currently working through the final resolution of the joints. And this is the project we're hoping to show in Shenzhen in December. So we're about to go into full scale production of this thing. Um, so yeah, so basically I guess what I like to think of my work is this, this constant um, experimentation through through making, constantly um, testing something through through a prototype, learning from it and going back and seeing what is the these interactions between um, emergent processes direct modeling processes and different fabrication techniques and methods and the way these come together. And I think, I like to think the, the work that we're building, where it has to just deal with all the realities of building and the problems of building, is actually much more interesting. I think the work is somehow better than the previous stuff, which was just digital. I think, that, um, I think somehow the interface of these two things makes the work stronger and more interesting. So, yeah. Thank you. Time for questions. Is a question? Hello. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's really inspiring. Finally, see the work well explained. The work well explained. Because I've seen many of your images and see your stuff, and I sit next to the <laughs> living room every day. And, um, I really enjoy it, and I, I, I think I saw the bridge project a while ago. This is really something. Um, I've, I've also worked on algorithmic design, but from a completely different perspective. So I, I have a originally I had a visceral reaction against this idea of having complex geometries for the sake of having complex geometries on the parametrization uh, system from Patrick mm -hmm. Schumacher. So I said, how can we make uh, generative design and, and algorithmic design as boring as possible? And I started working with grids and uh, 3D panel, uh, square panels in, in a very, very regular lattice. And the take was um, looking into function and how spaces actually uh, communicate with each other rather than structure and uh, these different scales of um, functional pieces. So you, you, you mentioned that you go from something that is structural to something that is ornamental, ornamental to something that is spatial. Uh, using the same elements at different scales and, and making them interact with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my question is, how do you reconcile this wonderful generative creations that you've managed to 
put out with the more pedestrian aspects of architecture, like providing a horizontal surface for people to stand on, or uh, a room where you can actually put a sofa in, and you don't have to put it in the middle of the room, but you can put it against the wall so you can <laughs> yeah, okay. be relatively efficient. Um, well, I think I used probably a few years ago if I was trying to answer this question. I'm getting a very long-winded answer, which probably just evades your question. But, um, um, <laughs> Good strategy. Disclaimer at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I used to say I'm just a, I'm just kind of like a very regular architect in that um, I just want to make architecture. I just want to make buildings. That's what I care about. And, um, and everything I do, all the kind of processes and algorithms and robots are simply ways of making buildings. And I just want to try and make them in a way that I think is most interesting or best somehow. Um, but then I've sort of realized that that's not really true. And what I'm actually obsessed by certain types of processes and geometries. And I'm more obsessed with those than I am, am obsessed with architecture. And um, I really dislike the fact that architects generally think they can design everything. Like they, you know, architects love to design you know, chairs and objects and vases and whatever. And I generally think that buildings is hard enough as it is, so why don't you spend your lifetime trying to do one thing well rather than do everything sort of in a slightly mediocre way? But um, I guess I've realized that I'm not an architect who wants to design all sorts of different things. I'm actually just somebody who's a specialist in a particular type of process and geometry, and I'm trying to work out where it can live, what, what it can be. And so I think architecture, I guess my practice is now doing two things. It does um, small architectural projects where we've got enough control to reimagine how it's built, and then we are trying to do public artwork and um, gallery scale installations. And that's where I sort of feel like this work can exist. So in a way, it doesn't really have to answer your question because it's not trying to generate, you know, no longer trying to generate skyscrapers with flat floors or whatever. Um, it's just trying to, <laughs> it's just trying to be the thing. It, it's, I think I've got to, finally got to the point where I'm just, I can accept that it's just going to be what it's going to be and it doesn't have to try and um, do everything. So. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> I had a question. All those last structures are made of that agent bodies, the three bodies you show? Yep. Like the one with one board and the other. Yeah, so these typically have about um, um, you know, two or three arms and two or three legs, and um, they all just kind of connect, connect to each other. Yeah. And they have like, uh, some, for example, in the bridge, they have the, the idea of crossing the bridge, and then the sculpture, they, they have the idea of filling the sculpture. How, how do you work? Yeah, so um, they, they typically don't have that many behaviors. So, um, and they always have some external input to them. Um, so with the bridge, we model parts of the bridge. Um, we model sort of, we more or less knew certain elements we wanted, um, and then those became attractors to the agents, so they would um, be attracted to it. Whereas other parts are allowed to um, be more free in the way that they emerge. I didn't show, this, uh, this photograph is actually not of the Pompidou Center project, this one's actually of the titanium project we did, and it's for um, a ceremonial mace that we made for RMIT University, and I probably need images to describe it, but it's like, you know, it's a mace, so it's like it's a little weapon, and it has um, it has a handle, which is quite smooth, and it's basically all these agents kind of compress onto um, something you can hold, um, but then when it gets to the top of the mace, they're allowed to be more expressive, because, um, you know, at that point, they're supposed to be ornamental, expressive, and they don't really have a function of having to be held or make a particular type of geometry. So in other words, at some point, we want we deliberately constrain the agents and make them more likely to connect to the surface we've already modeled. And then other points, we just allow them to, to be more bottom-up, I guess. And I think a lot of what we try to do is try to balance these two things. And the worst projects we do are ones where the generative stuff looks like it's stuck onto the, the directly modeled parts. And I think the better projects are those where there's a genuine synthesis between them. And they, it's a bit blurry as to what's what. I guess the mace is different because one is clear, you know, there's a clear gradient between those which are really constrained and those which are very free. You kind of read, read that shift. So yeah, but in terms of the bridge, yeah, we design, I mean, 
it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Some problems are simple problems. And it doesn't make sense to try and you know, write behaviors for an agent to solve a problem that we can, we're really good at solving. With no, we know a lot about architecture. We know like, you know, about a bridge or something. We need to try and um, predict what rules that they'll need. Um, maybe just the last question for us. Um, so how much of your time is spent between the algorithm design, working with the algorithm once you've designed it to kind of originate the design, and then turning that design and materialising that design? Are they roughly equal parts? Or? Probably in an ideal world they would be. Yeah. But um, in reality, we uh, haven't done that much um, new algorithm design in the last few years. And the focus has been on um, on how to build them. That's I guess been the, been the most research. In a given project, there's probably equal time spent between design, and the kind of building and rationalization. But it's probably fairly even. Um, I'm trying to carve out more time to um, to work on algorithms again. And we're, um, now that the lab is, is starting to grow, we have one. Um, PhD candidates looking at the relationship between machine learning and multi agent algorithms and try to um, see what we can produce with that. And another one that's looking at the relationship between topology optimization and multi agent algorithms. And that's the first time really we're devoting a lot of resources back into the computational work because most of it has been just using computation as a way of building from the last four or five years. So, but I, um, in some ways, like I'm not, I'm not super interested in the tools. Like I'm, I'm really interested. But in surely, the design. that's the foundation of your practice, right? The, com the algorithm is the foundation of your practice. Yeah. So it's a bit glib to say you're not interested in the tools. So it's just you, 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 are, you. Okay, you might be. You don't care how it's done, but the foundation of your design process is through computation. Well, yeah. So on the one hand, of course, I'm obsessed with that one. Yeah. Because you have to be. To yeah. Be able to work and to do them. But, um, you know, I, I think they're always in service of something else. I'm not sure. But, um, well, I think we can talk about it later. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree, I think. Well, the other thing I realize is that um, I constantly reframe my <laughs> practice and my interests. Yeah. So, you know, as in, as in, I said a few years ago, I'd say I'm just an architect, I'm trying my architecture, and now I'm actually don't care how it's. Um, Positioned, and I guess I've, I've gone totally gone through periods where I've um, I've just suspended whole interest in in architecture just to focus on just on algorithms, mm. and now I'm going through a period of suspending my interest in algorithms so I can just figure out how to get robots to work. Yeah. Um, so I probably probably if you ask me on a different day <laughs> okay. or a different month, I might give you a different answer. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, maybe we could have Roland come back on a different day and give a different answer. But <laughs> <laughs> please join me in thanking Roland for a great talk. <laughs> Thanks so much.